I'm supposed to teach after hearing World War II songs that so many men sang and never came back. And I hear those songs, I always first of all think of those who didn't come back. Wonderful men. And they provided the fantastic freedom that they never had the chance to enjoy. And along with a few others, I'm one that has had the opportunity all of these years to appreciate and enjoy the things for which we were fighting for in that generation. It is always wonderful to me to understand and appreciate the grace of God in all of these things. Tonight I am 81 years old, and there were a number of times in War II when I didn't think I would ever see 26. But that's the way it goes, and God in His marvelous grace has provided a generation at that time that met every possible danger and most of the friends that I grew up with, the men that I played football with, all of the wonderful people that I knew, 85% of them never came back. Whenever I go to California, there are usually at least three that I know that are still alive and we always get together for a lunch. And it's always sad at the end because we know this may be the last time on earth that we will ever see each other and honor the memory of those of our friends who did not come back. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher. And as such, he makes it possible for us to understand the wonderful things that are found in the Word of God. It is always wonderful to realize that everything that God wanted us to know is in one book. And therefore, in preparation for our study of that one book, it is always our purpose to spend a few moments in silent prayer to give you the option of rebound if necessary to ensure the filling of the Spirit who is our mentor, our teacher and will bring to our memory those things which we have forgotten and often at very important times. In preparation, let us pray. grateful Heavenly Father for the privilege and the opportunity of fellowshipping in the Word, the Word which is alive and powerful. We pray that God the Holy Spirit will make it very real to us tonight, for we ask it in Christ's name, Amen. I'm holding in my hand a Bible. This is the King James Version. On the back it says, we serve proudly the United States Army. On the front it says, Dea Christu Nicao, through Christ I conquer, the bottom that has my name. This is a King James Version. I uh, do not study from this or read it, but in the past I memorized many portions of it. This is the only book that we need to know and understand. Today people are trying to understand what's going on in life, what the trends happen to be and so on. And everyone who is a believer in Jesus Christ needs to find everything right here. If believers spent as much time 
in the Word as they do. And well, let's see right here. There's something in here that's messing up this Bible. Oh, here it is. The Houston Chronicle. <laughs> I uh, enjoy the Chronicle, sports page, and front page, and other things. And it says here, Serbs capture three U.S. soldiers, Pentagon fears. Well, it was confirmed. And they were captured. They were armed. They had no ammunition. We have lost track of how to fight a war, if we're going to fight a war. The Serbs have been fighting for their freedom for 1,300 years, and they know how to fight. Why we are over there, I'll never understand it. Because in World War II, we didn't have that kind of an issue. We were fighting tyranny. We were not a police nation. We fought under our own flag. We fought under our own officers most of the time. This represents all of the news that we get today on television. And it's great. If, you, if you're going to have freedom, you have to have the fourth estate. That is, of course, the news media. And it comes to us in many forms, as you know. You can press a button and hear the news. Now, how accurate it is, we don't know. Sometimes it's very accurate and sometimes it isn't. Many times it is slanted. And therefore, it is used really as propaganda. They want you to think what they think rather than what is the truth of the situation. And that's the way it is. But it's still freedom. And there, but it will get to you sooner or later if you're not careful. And so we have magazines, we have the Time magazine, we have the Newsweek, and we have all kinds of magazines. We have, we have television, and we have the newspaper. One thing you can almost count on to be accurate, and that is basketball and football scores. <laughs> That's a comfort. I have, uh, th I, I found this in an interesting place. I found this in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, even in the King James, this is translated well, men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, fierce, despisers of those who are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Having a form of the spiritual life. The word God in this is used there, but that's used to buy it. It means the spiritual life. So we're talking about believers here. Having a form of the spiritual life, but denying the power thereof. That is why we are punished. Denying the power thereof. The power of of God the Holy Spirit, the revelation of God the Father, and of God the Son. Then it goes on to say, having a form of godliness, in other words, overtly, they are often very moral, but very self-righteous and so on, but that isn't the spiritual life. The spiritual life is far greater than that. The spiritual life goes from the soul out, not from the front end. And then we come to the next verse which says, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins led away with divers' lusts. Now that isn't sea divers, that means various lusts. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now I want to point out something to you that I think is very important as we begin our Bible study this evening. Many people spend more time wanting to know what's in the paper, what's in the news, 
They read books about everything in the world outside of this. And talking about believers now. And they think they have the answer to everything. But what has actually happened is that they have spent so much time with these things that they have lost track of this right here. That's what's happened to believers today, and that's why it says always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's the thing that counts right here, the knowledge of the truth in this Bible. This is what it counts. And people are being wooed away without even realizing it by being so preoccupied with what we have here in this paper and all of the things that are happening and damning this and commending this and all the rest of it. And we're not left on this earth as believers to do that. We're not left here to get so involved in these things that somehow we think as Christians, by getting involved in politics, by t talking to people about what is right and what is wrong and what is going on in our country, that somehow we're going to change this country. We are not. We are under four cycles of discipline right now. And we are not going to change this country as Christians. We can impact this country for God, but it's in this book. It is not in this news. And the news is going to get worse and worse and worse. You have no idea how horrible things are today and how, and how close we are to being destroyed. But if we are destroyed, it's going to be the fifth cycle of discipline which we have studied. And I want to remind you, before that you get so preoccupied with reading all the different papers and getting involved in all of these things and getting involved in Christian activism, which is a terrible form of arrogance. Think of Christians wasting their ammunition, their energy on Christian uh, getting involved in all of these things that they are not going to change. They are whitewashing the devil's world. And they think about these things, and they want to know these things. They want to learn everything about them. And it's the devil's world. And the last generation that ever understood and fought for these things, and that's what it comes down to. Was my generation. When I think of those gallant men who gave their lives, and I thought about them on the platform here just a little while ago, they went through the Depression and all of it. But they weren't talking about those things. They were honorable men, they were wonderful men. We are going to be destroyed as a client nation to God if born-again believers do not wake up. But you see, a lot of this is the fault of the ministers. Today, ministers are encouraging this thing. Today, they are encouraging Christian activism, which is a form of arrogance, a terrible form of arrogance, getting involved in whitewashing the devil's world. And yet, there's only one way that we can stop and halt the inevitable disaster we are facing right now. Now, you don't even know there's a disaster yet. You think all is well. But that's what they said in the Old Testament. Shalom, shalom, they said. Peace, peace. When there is no shalom, there is no peace. And that's what they said before they went down. And what does shalom mean? Well, it's translated peace, but it means one, two things. First of all, it means prosperity. And they said prosperity, prosperity, when there is no prosperity. And then it means no war, no war. There is no war. 
but God uses nations to destroy nations that have failed him. And we are a client nation to God. That is the great tragedy that we face today. What a tragedy. It's a wonderful thing on the back of this to serve your country. We serve proudly. That's a wonderful thing. That's on the back. But on the front of this Bible that I've kept all these years in just this form, Via Christu Nikao, through Christ I conquer. Now, if you and I are going to save this nation, we're not going to do it through politics. Any believer with a half a brain knows that. Look what the politicians have done. Well, don't. I won't get into that because I believe in the separation of church and state. And you're not going to save the country except one way only. And that is the execution of the unique spiritual life of the church age, forming a pivot of believers in play Roma. And that's the only thing. And there's another little slip of paper in here. Jesus Christ controls history. Direct control through the function of the divine attributes, both in time and in eternity. And I notice here in this note that I once wrote, through the decision of the Supreme Court of Heaven. Indirect control the function of the laws of divine establishment, principles related to the individual, marriage, family, and the national entity, all of this found in Romans 13, 1 through 7. The pivot of winter believers, invisible heroes. That's what we need to be. You will never be an invisible hero until you reach play Roma. When this country needs invisible heroes. And you are qualified because you have believed in Jesus Christ. And that's the only thing that's going to save this nation. Not this. That is not going to save the nation. And of all the follow well, I won't get into the follow-ups. It's tragic. Jesus Christ also has, of course... Hostile witnesses in controlling history. The hostile witnesses are mentioned in Psalm 76.10. For the wrath of man shall praise you. Praise God. Even those who try to destroy, serving Satan, try to destroy everything that we stand for. Jesus Christ so controls history that he turns it around. The wrath of man shall praise you. Legal control through liability to the laws of volitional responsibility. Hosea 8, 7, the principle is found there. The sovereignty of God and the free will of man coexist in human his history in order to resolve the prehistoric angelic conflict. And we are in the middle of it. And by getting so wrapped up in this, that you're drowning in this kind of thing. Drowning in it. You're gradually getting away from this. And I see believers in Baraka Church doing just that. You want to know everything about out here. You've got all these opinions and all these solutions, and everything's going fine, and you're wrong. Everything is not going fine. Everything that I see looks exactly the way it was in 1940, when I received my commission as a second lieutenant in the United States Cavalry, and you, I couldn't even be brought on active duty until they had the money, because the money was being used for all of the socialistic activities of the of government at that time. The witness for the prosecution in the rebuttal phase of Satan's appeal trial personal witnesses for the prosecution, the believer who executes the spiritual life. Corporate witnesses, well, we've studied the corporate testimony of marriage. Jesus Christ controls history to guarantee the preservation of Israel. And through 
and uh, through three generations of born-again believers in the Old Testament, a new racial species called Israel was formed. We've studied that in Romans 9 in great detail, verses 7 through 13. And I notice here, hence Jesus Christ is called the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that is Exodus 3, 6, and 15 and 16, Exodus 4, 5, Matthew 22, 32, Mark 12, 26, Luke 20, 37, Acts 7, 32. Many passages. One of the great titles of Jesus Christ, he is the God of Israel. And today, Israel is not a client nation to God. There are Jews in the land. They will not be a client nation to God again until the second advent of Christ. But they will exist in spite of everything Satan has done to destroy them. God does not tolerate anti-Semitism, therefore history is cluttered with the wreckage of Gentile nations who sought to eliminate the Jews. And from Moses to Christ, five Jewish client nations were operational. And... They, of course, were a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, Exodus 19.6, and they always survived it. Jesus Christ controls history through the preservation of planet Earth. Colossians 1.17, in him all things hold together. In fact, Jesus Christ holds the universe together by the word of his power, Hebrews 1.3. And not until the termination of human history will Jesus Christ destroy the universe, 2 Peter 3, 10 through 12, and we will study those passages uh, at a future time. Furthermore, mankind does not have the power either to destroy the earth or the universe. He doesn't even have that power. And furthermore, spiritual freedom will continue to exist for the born-again believer until the end of human history because Jesus Christ controls history. There is therefore no place for a false agenda of Christian activism or even something that I consider to be much more subtle, and that is to become so involved in wanting to know all about what's going on and getting involved in all of the political things and all the rest that you do not have time to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And right now we are at a place in our study of the Word of God where these questions are going to be answered using even some of the concepts, the battle line and all of those things. Now I'd like to review some of the things that we have been studying so that you will understand. First of all, the emphasis is always on Bible doctrine. God has placed emphasis on His Word, Bible doctrine. It is Bible, if the thing to know is Bible doctrine, and if you don't learn Bible doctrine, you will spend your life learning, but never coming to a knowledge of the truth. The truth is in the Word of God, that's why. Secondly, Christ magnified His Word above His name, and we've studied that. The importance of that, this was, of course, was absolutely necessary during the hypostatic union or his first advent. We have studied, therefore, that Christ emphasized doctrine during the dispensation of the hypostatic union. Not only did he emphasize doctrine, but he emphasized the spiritual life which he would give to us and never existed before, and that is our present study. We have been studying that for over 1,500 hours. And therefore, we have noted that salvation and eternal life emphasizes the work of Christ on the cross, which we continually note, and that is very important, because new believers will come in when some will have an enthusiasm for the Word, and unless you're careful, they're going to pass you up in the spiritual life because they've gone through all of this and it's left them flat. But you haven't learned that. And you always want to know and want to argue, want to get involved in that sort of thing. So the emphasis is on the work of the cross. And the emphasis is what think ye of Christ is the way it's quoted in the, in the King James English. The emphasis is on faith alone and Christ alone. 
And also we have noted arrogance, ignorance, and emotion emphasize sin or works. And yet we have discovered Jesus Christ carried our sins in his own body on the cross. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. We have also noted the unique spiritual life of the church age is a supernatural way of life. It emphasizes be filled with the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 5, 8. It should be translated as, as it is, a present active imperative, a, an imperative mandate. Keep on being filled with the Spirit and walk by means of the Spirit. And greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. All talking about our mentor. And not by power nor by might, but by my, peri- by my spirit, saith the Lord. And then we have emphasized stop grieving the Holy Spirit, stop quenching the Holy Spirit, and grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We've also noted that believers are emphasizing the wrong things. For salvation, they emphasize works, human good, and they reject faith alone in Christ alone. And for the Christian way of life, they emphasize the energy of the flesh. And they reject the power of God, the Holy Spirit. And for the Christian way of life, they emphasize human good and reject knowledge of Bible doctrine. And doctrine, grow in grace, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, is something you hear, but it doesn't seem to click in your motivation. The emphasis then, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, there are exceptions in this congregation, many wonderful ones. Believers today are emphasizing the wrong things, then the Christian life, of course, salvation, and doctrine, and above all, Christian fellowship. They emphasize social life and reject what it really is, harmonious rapport with God. And then, therefore, we are on this thing and a very strong principle, hold that thought. And what thoughts are we holding? How cursing is turned to blessing. We are saying we are also holding the thought, blessing is not in suffering, it is in the divine solution. And the divine solution to suffering, therefore, provides the blessing. We saw Paul's thorn in the flesh, and he prayed three times, take it away. But prayer is not the solution. And God said three times, no, 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 you're on the wrong track, Paul. You don't pray to take that away. You're going to miss the blessing. Remove the suffering, and you remove the divine solution. Stay with the suffering, and you have the divine solution. Remove the divine solution, you remove the divine blessing. Remove the divine blessing, and you remove spiritual growth, advancing in your spiritual life. And then there's the degree of punishment. All sins were judged on the cross. God is fair. By the way, all sins have different they are, they are in different categories. They're not all the same. And some are stronger than others. And God ordained that on certain things that there should be capital punishment and other things, other ways in which the punishment should be carried out. So there's a great deal of difference between sins. And God is fair, and God's punishment to the believer is fair. And spirituality is an absolute, and spiritual growth is relative. And new believers, baby believers, adolescent believers, and adult believers are all in different stages when they are hit with punishment from God, as we are studying. And therefore, the punishment is related to their stage. Because if they rebound, as per 1 John 1, 9, as the punishment is then turned to suffering for blessing. But it has to be something that they can handle. 
And we have studied the passage that tells us there is no testing that has overtaken you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful who will never permit you to be, permit you to be tested beyond your capability. And therefore, if you are in the first stage beyond your capability, well, you're in the punishment, the punishment will be reduced so that you can handle that as your capability, and blessing will come out of it. And that is a part of the spiritual life, as I've been pointing out to you. This is, of course, is a new concept of the spiritual life. We've noted three concepts. So we've noted this. We've noted the, therefore, how important is the law of volition responsibility. We've noted the to whom much is given, much is required, and that the believer is responsible for doctrine he has learned and for the doctrine he has forgotten. And the more mature believer, the longer he stays out of fellowship, the greater the degree of punishment, degree of punishment, like David and Moses. And the more immature the believer, the lesser his degree of punish, unless he is in perpetual carnality. In the Exodus generation, did not learn and live, did not live and learn. They lived and died the sin unto death. And, of course, we have learned that we reap what we sow. That's true of all of us. And as your pastor, I don't want you to get into the wrong, on the wrong side of that one. And, therefore, it is important that you understand these things because I see a growing ten. I see that that newspaper is coming between you and Bible doctrine. There's nothing wrong with the newspaper. The fact is that we pick up a lot of information and so on, and it's a part of our freedom. But you are not ever, ever, ever going to be here on this world under God's grace, except for one reason, to become an invisible hero, because God will only bless this nation through invisible heroes, pleromotypes. And that's what we need. And you find that in the Bible. So you just take this out and give it its proper place, and you go with this. But if you... I see people going with this. And I'm concerned. But you'll notice on the back of this, when we get into it, Freedom through military victory is the only principle on the, in the, on the format uh, outside of our spiritual life. And that's found in the Word of God, and I've thought it in great detail. And there it is. And maybe that would be interesting. Wouldn't it be interesting if the flower children generation to had to all go to war? But if they could make it through military training under God's blessing. Because there comes a time when a nation can only survive by going to war. And therefore, the most important of the most important things we have outside of our jurisprudence is the military. And the military suffers because people despise it, because it represents everything that they have rejected discipline and training and hardship and suffering. That's what the military is all about when you get to preparing for combat. Well, we have noted now the quotation of the two imperatives of prohibition in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5. Incidentally, that's my birthday message to you. Now let's get into our message here. We have a few moments. And the quotation includes the two imperatives of prohibition. And then we know what that is, the present active imperative plus the negative may, and it means to stop doing something. And we've noted the two translations. My son, stop, decide, stop despising the punishment of the Lord. And my son indicates we're members of the family of God, the royal family of God. My son, stop despising the punishment of the Lord. And, of course, to hate the punishment of the Lord for carnality is 
to reject the love of God is part of the integrity of God. One thing we can never do is to reject the love of God, and that's what carnality does. It rejects the love of God. And recovering from that, the hatred of, of divine punishment and rejecting the love of God is simply rebound. That's the only way we can do it. And that's why, for example, we have in Hebrews uh, chapter 12, verse 6, whom the Lord loves, he punishes. That's the way it is in the first place. And therefore, we have to go back to the principle. And by going back to the principle, we find this very important concept. In Hebrews 12, 5, and so you have forgotten the doctrinal principle of encouragement. We are going to be punished. There are four different Greek words in this passage in Hebrews for punishment. Everyone means punishment. Everyone has, some of them have different shades of punishment. But here we have the concept of punishment, and therefore the importance of understanding that the first imperative of prohibition warns us of the importance of rebound plus live and learn. And God's, of course, uh, love has not changed toward the believer no matter how far we sink into carnality. And therefore, in verse 5, so you have forgotten the doctrinal principle of encouragement which is addressed to you as sons. My son, stop despising or stop hating paideia. That's the word used here. Paideia from the Lord. Paideia means punishment from the Lord. Then in the second imperative of prohibition, and stop fainting when you are punished by him. And we have a different word here. Instead of paideia, we have uh, elekko, elekko. And elenco, it means even a stronger kind of punish, a punishment. Stop fainting when you are being punished by him. <clears throat> With that in mind, therefore, we started looking at some of the principles, which I promised you I would give you again. So here we go, and then we will continue these things as we progress in this study. We'll probably do something a little bit different for Easter. Uh, we usually have a lot of people who are not following this. Principle number one, divine punishment is not working if you faint in your soul. Faint in your soul means to be bitter, to resent it, to blame someone else. All of the sins that are related to self-justification. Justifying yourself takes a lot of different types of sins, and they are called here fainting in your soul. The second principle, divine punishment of the believer, only works when you endure it with the staying power of Bible doctrine. And the staying power of Bible doctrine is exactly what Jesus Christ had on the cross. It is personal love for God the Father, impersonal love for all mankind, and that is the love which is so important for us to have. Personal love for God the Father, impersonal love for all mankind. That's the staying power of Bible doctrine in the stream of consciousness. And it only works when the believer is filled with the Holy Spirit, obeying the mandate, keep on being filled with the Spirit. The third principle, therefore the filling of the Spirit, can only be restored to the carnal believer through rebound and keep moving, 1 John 1, 9, followed by Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14. There is therefore no change. The, the next principle is, and a very important one, divine integrity is administered in the exact same divine love as divine blessing. That's the fourth principle. The fifth principle, there is no change in divine love toward the believer in the varying circumstances of the spiritual life which run the gamut from success to failure and from failure to success. And the next principle that is related to it is a part of actually five. Success and failure, success to failure, and failure to success fulfill the principle of live and learn. Divine punishment, and by the way, live means to live under the punishment and learn from it. It's learning the hard way, as we've already noted. Divine punishment only works then when the believer endures it with the staying power of Bible doctrine in the soul as epinosis, after he has rebounded.
And inevitably, the greatest advance in your spiritual life will occur when you finally switch over to learn and live. Learn Bible doctrine and then live it. Live it under the sponsorship of the immutable love of God. <clears throat> learn, therefore, from 1 Peter 2, 4, 24, that Jesus Christ carried our sins in his own body on the cross, and that we are never judged for those sins. When we commit them, as this is a, such an important point of doctrine, and we've gone over it and over it, and now one more time before we move on, and that is this very simple point, that we are not judged for our sins. Our sins were punished on the cross. Jesus Christ took the punishment for our sins on the cross. He carried our sins in his own body on the cross. He was punished as a substitute for us. And therefore, we cannot be punished for what Jesus Christ has already been punished. It's like saying the punishment that he took is not efficacious, and yet that's the very basis for our salvation. The reason is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Greek is the same. Pistuse epiton kurion kais that they say su. It means simply this. Faith alone means there is no works you can add to it. Faith is non-meritorious. All the merit belongs to the object. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the object. And if you add anything, then you've canceled out faith and you're not saved. Just one time. It has to be faith in Christ without adding anything. And especially even superimposing things that are not found in this Bible. Not once does it ever say that you're to invite Christ into your heart or to invite Christ into your life. Never even mentioned. It's just a lot of emotional nonsense cooked up by people who do not know the Bible. It's faith alone in Christ alone. And therefore, we need to understand if we're not punished for our sins, why are we punished? We are punished because we are grieving the Holy Spirit. We are punished because we are quenching the Holy Spirit. We are punished because we are disobeying the mandates of our spiritual life. And we are punished because we are not executing our spiritual life. And therefore, we are punished because we are not with momentum of Bible doctrine in the soul advancing to the high ground to play Roma. That's what it's all about. The most powerful impact under Jesus Christ controls history is the invisible hero. And this is the dispensation of the invisible hero. And the invisible hero, wherever he is, advances to play Roma. And God blesses because of him. There are just a few Pleroma believers in this country today, and that's the only thing that is holding it together. It is not the economy. It is not all this giveaway money. It is not all this uh, pseudo-prosperity that you see. The only thing that is holding this country together right now is the fact that there are a few believers in these United States who have reached Pleroma, the invisible heroes. And that's the wonderful thing about the church age. The royal family is invisible in its power, but it's there until the resurrection body. And then those who are invisible heroes forever and ever in the body of immortality, the resurrection body, will have the most fantastic rewards above and beyond all of the other believers in resurrection bodies. That's because we have spiritual freedom. We don't have human freedom. We have spiritual freedom. Human freedom is disappearing. And that is one of the tragedies that we apparently are we do not see. So, the answer is not revolution. The answer is not to fight the authority. 
That is clearly presented in Romans 13. We are under the authority, and even though the authority by our Constitution are the servants of the people, they have now turned over and become the masters of the people. That was never intended by our founding fathers. But that is the status quo. Now, it does not call for violence or revolution against those who are in that status quo. It calls for you to get back here where you belong and have, under God's grace, the power to reach the high ground so that God will bless this nation through your advance to the playroom of status. That's what it's all about. And so, Father, we're grateful that we have been given that particular responsibility, and that responsibility means blessing for everyone in the nation. And that blessing we recognize is only going to come through those who, through their con their day-by-day -day decision to take in the Word of God, to grow in grace, and to rebound when necessary, and to continue, therefore, under the filling of the Spirit and the accumulation of metabolized doctrine in the soul to advance to maturity. We recognize that as the divine solution, the only solution, the biblical solution, and we pray that it might become very apparent as we continue to study the dynamics of the spiritual life given to us as an inheritance from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Challenge us by these things in Christ's name. Amen.